Well, first we'll, we'll toast. Cheers. Welcome home. Cheers. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me. So I'm just gonna set the scene here. Okay. Bass player for mm -hmm. alternative rock band Blue October. Mm -hmm. The band formed in 95, mm -hmm. 16 top 40 singles. And you're also a producer, yeah. songwriter, mm -hmm. and yeah. co-owner of Orb Recording Studios Correct. in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Whew. Uh, what a ride. Um, yeah. You know, how would you describe these past couple of decades um, living your dream yeah. in the music industry? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, I mean, honestly, like at kind of the risk of sounding a little corny, like I, I, I feel like every day I wake up and my problems that day seem so minuscule in the grand scheme of things, you know, because I'm like, I, I know so many people who who have jobs, you know, or have gigs and like, and they're just li like, they're doing whatever they're doing, living paycheck to paycheck or whatever it is. And they're still kind of like trying to figure out who they are, what they're trying to do. And I'm so fortunate because I get to do what I love mm. to do. And I have been doing that since day one, you know, and not like, it, not like it hasn't been a grind along the way. Cause there's definitely ups and downs just like anything else. But like music is kind of everything to me. It sort of always has been. So like being able to be in a band and tour and see the world and, and, you know, and play and connect with fans and connect with other people is really important to me, but also going home and being able to do that on another level is, is equally as important mm. to me. So getting to work with other bands and sort of, you know, produce and sort of be in other bands for little periods of time is, it's it's something that like I feel like is necessary. It's just like to me, it's not something I can live without at this mm. point. I kind of have to have it, um, you know. But uh, I don't know. I think my parents just raised me the right way too, though. You know, so. Cause I, cause I feel like I, um, I respect the people that I work with. And so I build these lifelong relationships mm. with them, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know, blessed for sure. Well, I can feel the gratitude and that's awesome. Yeah. Speaking of your parents, mm -hmm. you know, for this series, the mm -hmm. location has meaning. Yeah. Um, and word on the street is you grew up like literally right over there. Right across the street. <laughs> so we're at Mount Holiday you know, sitting here, childhood home, like mm -hmm. right behind you. Mm -hmm. What special memories come to mind? Oh my gosh. Like I, I feel like my formative years were pretty much like right here, <laughs> like literally right here. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I, I was born in Adrian, which is at the very, very bottom of the state. And then when I was 10, we moved up here and I grew up here and like all of my, I would say like my best memories, like where I formed like lifelong relationships and friendships that I still have to this day, like all happened right here in this neighborhood, mm. you know? So, ain't gotten some trouble in this neighborhood too, oh, you yeah. know, just like, <laughs> just like everybody else, you know, made some, some childhood mistakes and whatnot. But, um, but it's just like, this is such a, it's so special to me. This, this place is so special to me and this like holiday Hills and Traverse city in particular is like, oh God, it's just, it's my heart, you know? And so to me, like it's something that you can't really explain to people either though it's like you have to come here so over the but, years if i've had a friend or family or whatever that is and they come up to traverse city and they get to come see it for themselves and they all fall in love with it just like the band does and did it's you know at some point it's like no, no you have to go back to my neighborhood you have to see where i grew up and so it's this thing. yeah so you know after spending so much time on the road mm -hmm. and touring most of your life, when you do come back here, what are we gonna find you doing? And what are you showing your band members? Well, so these days we're, we're, well, we're all older now. So it's like chill, relax, you know, uh, it's funny because we have this uh, um, lake house. We have this place in Interlock and, and uh, my dad, and it was my grandparents' place and they passed it down to my dad and his brothers. And so our whole family mm. shares it. It's really, it's really cool. It's really special to us. And so every few years as a band, we can come up and stay there. And so if we have a few days off, it's like, okay, well we can go stay in, you know, Fort Wayne at a hotel or we can go to Traverse City. Yeah. It's a no brainer, you know? So, so we do that of course. And I've been in the band for 20 some years now. So like for us, it's like, it's so, it just has so much meaning coming back in the same place that we've been going for years and years on the same little lake and fishing and boating and kayaking and all that. And I, I, I actually, there's a journal there and I found a journal entry 
last night that our drummer had written in 2000. The first time we came up here in 2000 and reading it was just like put me in this crazy time warp. You know, I was like, oh my God, this is 21 years ago. Wow. You know? And his handwriting's still the same. That... Terrible handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> How does the area influence your music, especially mm. now knowing that it's not, you know, your whole, the band has a connection now continually coming to this yeah. cabin and interlocking. Does it, does yeah. the area oh influence gosh. your sound or That might be lyrics? my favorite question ever, honestly. <laughs> like, it really does because we have a song called Ugly Side and that was written here. We have a couple songs that were written here. They were written out at the lake house actually, but Ugly Side, there's a line in it that says a northern degree dove into me and that's all like about here, you know, it's about this whole area. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. It's, I mean, it's just crazy how inspirational this area really is. And as an artist and as a songwriter, you know, you come up here and you just look around or have an experience, you know, and sure. it's like, you know, I mean, I, I was just here this summer with my family and my daughter like, is like, what do I have to do to get you to move back here? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. well, it's not that easy, <laughs> you know? So. Going to high school in Traverse City, mm -hmm. so much has changed. What is the yeah. biggest thing when you come back here about the area that's different? I mean, it has changed a lot. It's grown a lot, um, but it's. Gr I don't think it's grown like in a, in a, a lot of times people get salty when they say this area has blown up or grown a lot. Like, I, so I live in Austin now and Austin has grown a lot and I do say that in a salty way, <laughs> but um, not here. I feel like everything here that I see is, is positive. Mm -hmm. Like I see a lot of really cool shops. I see a lot of like, you know, family owned businesses mm -hmm. and not necessarily like a ton of corporate stuff or anything like that. And I think that people are like, are really conscious of making sure that it sort of retains its identity. Mm -hmm. You know, that Northern Michigan has this, Traverse City in particular sort of has this vibe and has this thing. And so when you see certain places, you know, I'm 22 and stuff like that, like it kind of brings you back to that place. And I'm like, that's awesome. There's a pride here, you know, oh, yeah. that you don't necessarily get everywhere else. So I think it's a good thing. And what, like when you come back, like has stayed exactly the same? Oh, wow. Um, there's this one place, it's the Cherry Hut in Beulah, Michigan. Oh, I haven't yeah. been. So, when I was a kid, like that to me is like, I don't think they've changed the decor since the eighties, um, <laughs> but it is the best cherry pie I've ever had in my life. Okay, all right. And it's like, uh, I just, I feel like every time I go back there, I'm like, okay, I've been doing this since I was a kid and I'm right back, you know, like when I lived in Adrian, even before we moved to Traverse City, we would vacation at the campground in Beulah and we would always go to the Cherry Hut every summer. And so taking my kids there now, you know, that's like this whole full circle thing that's just crazy. That's and it's, special. Yeah, it is, it is very special. Cool. So was music always the plan? Oof. You know, as I've been <laughs> getting to know people around town, yeah. talking about you, letting, you know, people know I was going to have a drink with you. Yeah. I will. Many people have said, oh my gosh. Yeah. High school. Yeah. It playing in, in the basement. Um, yep. was there ever a plan B? Nope. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I went to college. I went to a couple colleges, uh, and I kind of just like, uh, didn't really care. You know, I didn't really like, I felt like I was maybe trying to appease somebody else or, or maybe I was supposed to do that because you're, you're just, you're raised to, you know, have a safety net and you're raised to, I don't want to say you shouldn't follow your dreams because you should follow your dreams, but you also want to be practical and you want to be smart, of course. And being a father, I preach those same things, Yeah. you know, but uh, it, the truth is that none of it really mattered to me, you know, going to class mm. at some point, I was like, this just isn't as important as having a gig on the weekend. If mm -hmm. I have a gig on a Sunday night, you know, when I went to Western, it's like, okay, if I have a gig on a Sunday night and it's go to 2 a.m., I'm not going to class at 8 a.m. on Monday. It's just not going to happen. Right. I'm going to do the gig because yeah. that's what I want to do. And that's what I care about. And I mean, that goes back to high school, middle school, like battle the bands. You know, I don't have any hobbies. I mean, like, I, you know, that's all I that was everything to me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess I got pretty lucky in that sense. I'm curious to know the business side of music. Mm -hmm. So how was that experience taking this passion and then making a career? the business side of the music industry. Yeah, I actually, I do a lot of mentoring these days. So I work with a lot of younger kids uh, and I work um, with a couple different programs and uh, that's something I really like to do. Um, 
when I was in college, ele elementary ed was actually the plan. The the I guess that was sort of the backup oh, plan. Oh, okay. So I kind of found a clever way to sort of marry those two things together, you know. And so now I can take what I've been through with the music business and sort of teach these other kids and their parents and these families, like, hey, don't do this, you know, do this. A lot of don't do this, but um, I can kind of help them navigate everything. But the truth with the music business is, it's in some ways, it's a lot like every other business. You know, you have to you have to have marketing, you have to have PR, you have to have a product, you have to have all these other things in place. But it's also not like any other business in in the sense that it is constantly changing and mm. it's constantly evolving. And just when you think you have something figured out, if you get stuck in your ways and set in your ways, you don't realize that you're going to get left behind because you're not challenging yourself and you're not keeping your ear to the ground. You know, Spotify, for example, came along and like radio 10 years ago is everything. And Spotify now is everything. And there are people that just resist those things, you know? And I mean, I could go on and on and on about this stuff. Would you say yeah. that's one of the reasons you've been able, like besides talents and, mm -hmm. and the drive, but also that you're willing to adapt? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm not a complacent mm -hmm. kind of person. Like, I, I've, I feel like I've always been super restless, you know? Like, um, uh, that's just kind of my nature, I think, sure. you know? So, um, and that can be good and bad, but I think for, for the most part, like, I, I would say that my career path has sort of mirrored that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, um, I, I, I love producing kind of going back to what I was saying earlier is like I get to be in another band I get to it's like oh I get to be in a reggae band this week or I get yeah. to do country this week or whatever that is and jump around and do different things but like that kind of satisfy my sort of ADD nature I guess <laughs> where it's like I get to do multiple things you know instead of just being doing the one thing and having yeah. one thing is your life um you know you touched on how you work with my one of my questions was mm -hmm. um what do you tell young artists and musicians who want to pursue it full time what's your yeah. kind of what's the first thing that you, that you say <laughs> I would say well so the first thing that I say is um we'll be open-minded of course you know I think anybody who's closed-minded and isn't going to listen is going to be willing to try things I don't see the music industry being a path for you period mm. you know but the the most important thing in my opinion and I do preach this to everybody like everybody it doesn't matter what genre it is it doesn't matter you know who you are how long you've been doing it is you have to be you you have to be unique and don't be perfect there's such mm. a this like american idol and in um the voice and these other shows like they're really good entertainment and and, and there are some really great artists that have come out of there but th there's this emphasis on being perfect mm. and nobody cares about that like mm -hmm. nobody nobody turns on the radio or turns on spotify and they're like oh listen to what an amazingly perfect vocal that is no that's not what people are listening for people want to hear something they've never heard and if it's about a feeling too. A feeling, an emotion, like some kind of a connection, you know. And so that's like the first thing I say to artists is like, if you're if you're worried about being perfect, you need to stop and you need to just reset your thinking. Mm -hmm. You need to figure out what it is about you that's not like anybody else in the world. And how do you focus on that? Mm -hmm. How do we make that known? Mm -hmm. You know. Now, when people look at you and they see all your successes, I always like to ask, you know, what have some of those challenges been, mm -hmm. and then. How did you overcome them? So I know it always yeah. helps me to keep going. It's like yeah. hearing other people's stories where it's like, no, there was a time I wanted to give up and I didn't. And right For around sure. the corner, yeah. you know, that the big break happened. Yeah. So is there anything that stands out in your journey? For sure. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we've had a lot actually um, in, we actually put a DVD out not too long, uh, DVD, sorry, documentary out not too long ago. Um, that really kind of uh, followed for seven years. It followed the tribulations and trials of the things that we went through as a band. And we had some really low lows as a band. And then we had some really high highs as a band. And then we came to this place where we're at now, which fortunately is awesome. Um, but it definitely like, uh, it was it was very well done. And it was very honest and it was very yeah. real. And I feel like that was a really good reflection. And like, I can go back and watch that now with a different perspective and I can see it and be like, wow, man, like today's not a bad day. You know, like you, you've been through some stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and you came out the other side, you can come out the other side of anything if you can get through this. But I would say the biggest thing for us is, and I'm so grateful that this happened, even though at the time I was so broken over it, 
we got dropped. We actually, so when I first joined the band, we, we signed with Universal, mm -hmm. who's obviously, you know, a huge company. And we went and made this, like, just, I don't even know what the final bill for the record was. It was, like, astronomical, right? And there was all this pressure. And then we put the record out and, like, crickets. Like, nobody bought it. Nobody cared. And we got dropped. And that was really hard because when you're in your early 20s and you're in a rock band and you're signed and you're in the nicest studio in L.A. and all this. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, never mind. You know, it's like, wow. What's, you know, what's next? That's scary. And then... What happened though was we actually just figured out how to grind and not expect things and not just, okay, well, like everything's just gonna happen for you. Instead, right. it was, okay, we're gonna go make it happen. Mm. We're gonna go into a studio on our own dime and we're gonna keep writing and we're gonna put a song out and we're gonna have our own radio people and we're gonna see if we can get some traction. And then we wound up getting signed to the same label, the exact same label. It's like getting back together again, you know. Uh, a couple years later, and they were like basically on their hands and knees, like, please, please come back. Mm -hmm. And that was a good place to be in for sure. But wow. that was, I think the lesson there was, you know, you can, you can whine and complain about it and you can feel sorry for yourself or you can mm. work, get back love to it. work. I love that yeah. grit and perseverance. Thank you. What are some of the high highs and the pinch me moments mm. that keep you going? Like, is there just, whether it was someone you worked with or performed for, I don't know, just yeah. kind of like, wow. Thinking of like the little boy in Traverse City and these yeah. big dreams and then fast forward and you're at the, a moment. Yeah, um, there've been a lot. Uh, opening for the Stones, 2006, 2007, that was a big one. Yeah, that was a big one. Um, <laughs> I'd say, yeah. <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was, it was very surreal because it was, you know, like y your whole life. It's, it's not like, and I had a bunch of my favorite bands, and we've become friends with and played with a lot of those bands, mm -hmm. and that's really cool. But the Stones are just on their own level, you know. Like, I mean, there's a handful of bands that ever get to that place, and so like when you're actually there and it's a reality, and you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm on stage, and then you get off stage, and then you meet the band, and you're like, this is actually happening. This is real. That was definitely like one of those moments, you know, where it was like, okay, like at, at this point, everything could just go south, right. and I'm good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I got that in my back pocket. You can't yeah. take that away from me. Um, that was that was a big deal for sure. Uh, but we, I mean. Now, I would say, like, one thing that I really love is we play Disney every year. <laughs> we get to take our kids. Yeah, that is, like, I'm, like, the coolest dad in the world when that oh happens. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, right. That's oh, that's favorite. so good. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about uh, being a father. Mm -hmm. But really quick, as we're still kind of on... Uh, music stuff mm -hmm. tell me about your recording studio in yeah. austin texas yeah um yeah what's the deal with that so opening a commercial recording studio in 2014 a lot of people told my partner and i that we were nuts you know they were like you're crazy everybody records at home now and then you know you've got like you know bands like hosier and billy eilish and bands like that that make very very successful albums on a like in a bedroom, yeah, you know, or in a hotel or whatever that is. But we, I mean, it's just one of those things where we really believed in the vision. And we saw that in Austin, there were other studios and there were good studios, but I was doing so much production work that when we made this idea together, it all just clicked and it just made sense. And we said, okay, everybody thinks we're crazy, but we're gonna do it anyway. And in the first year we had Skrillex, we had Bieber, we had Avicii, we had, all these huge acts came through and it was total validation and it was like, see, there is a need for this. Like people do still need a, a space that they feel comfortable and that they yeah. love to be in when they're creative and when they're making an album. And the and honestly, you know, over the last year and a half, that has been everything. That's been my home. So I've been so lucky to be, you know, to be able to kind of pivot and go, okay, I'm I'm now I'm yeah. writing, of course, but I'm producing full time and Super not missing cool. a beat. You know? Speaking of pivoting, mm -hmm. I feel like 2020 was the year of the pivot. Oh, yeah. um, how was the pandemic, how did it affect your work? Oof. It was, uh, I mean, there were so many unknowns, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, that was the hardest part is, like, I feel like 
I feel like the, all of us in the band are, are very, like, we're all pretty driven people, you know, and we're all, like, we kind of have our own things going on, too, so mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, the, like, the, we can't tour, my world has fallen apart, you know, like, we're, we're not really in that place, you know. The hardest part for us is not, honestly, just being together and yeah. not being able to go connect with our fans. That's why this tour means so much, is being able to do that again. That's more important than anything, but, but we, uh, it, the, the weirdest thing was, we actually did pre-production. We flew in our whole crew. Mm. We had three, like two weeks of rehearsals, three days of full pre-production with lights and everything. And we load up the bus and we go and the first day of the tour, everything got shut down. The oh. very first day of the tour. And it was, okay, you're going home. Live Nation's shut down. But it was also in the couple weeks leading up to that, the news kept getting more, more and more grim and scary and weird. And mm -hmm. so by that time it was kind of like, okay, this is, we kind of knew it was going to happen. The hardest part was just not knowing after yeah. that, when are we going back out? When are we going back out? And it's just, you know, everybody was dealing with that though, you know? Sure. Um, but being in the entertainment business, like that's a hard pill to swallow, you know? Like we're the last people to go back. We're the last, mm -hmm. the last thing that's gonna come back is concerts. And the tour you're on now, mm -hmm. um, is that is is that what was supposed to happen then? Is so so the tour now, um, I mean, it's all rerouted. It's not we didn't take the exact same tour and just push it back necessarily. Sure. We've act, so we're touring with the Goo Goo Dolls next summer, and that is now on its third summer. <laughs> it was supposed to be 2020, then it was going to be sure. this last summer. Now it's going to be next year, but this tour, our manager and our booking agent who are so awesome at what they do, they just they just knew like look when it's time and and you know when we're up and it, we are able to do this and able to do it safely we're not going to miss this we're not going to miss an opportunity so they kept getting ready and getting ready and have like something set up for us and so this tour is actually the longest tour i can remember us doing it's three months and we're not you know we're we're in our 40s so you know we'll do a, a month and then go home for a couple weeks yep. and go back out this is no you're going to be out three months three, okay the whole country you know, cool. so, but we were all like, man, we've been off for so long, like, and it's finally happening, you know, Yay. like, let's do it. <laughs> let's make it happen. Well, I don't want to bring up your children when you're away from them right yeah. now, but what, yeah. um, you know, in addition to everything you're doing professionally, mm -hmm. you're also a father. Yeah. What is, I'm just curious, kind of a fun question. Yeah. What's something no one told you about parenting? Oh my gosh. Well, so one thing is, so I have three kids, mm -hmm. right? And when there were two, it was, okay, we can divide and conquer. Nobody said, uh-uh, when you have a third, you're done. Like you're outnumbered, there's nothing you can do. And then we had our third and our third wound up being our wild kid too, Grayson. And he is just like chatterbox all over the place, constantly getting into stuff. And he came along and just totally like changed our whole world, you know? And I, I mean, he's, don't get me wrong, he's amazing. Um, but it was like- <laughs> Yeah, wait a second. Who, where was everybody? Why didn't you tell us, you know, that we were gonna be outnumbered yeah, at this point? It's so funny. funny. So what's next? I mean, you live in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever see yourself moving back? Ooh. And actually, that's a two-parter. Yeah. So it's a professionally, I guess, what's next. Yeah. And also, uh, yeah, do you ever see yourself coming back? I do. I actually do. Yeah, my my kids love it here. Like, they just love Traverse City. They love Northern Michigan. My daughter was just, I mean, she's 13, you know. So oh. every, everything, her head's in the clouds about everything, you know. It's like, no, we'll just come on. And I'm like, yeah, it's not practical, you know, right now. And studio and everything. But I, I do think that as we get into the twilight of our touring career and things wind down i i have always had designs to come back here i've always i've always thought it would be really cool to come back up here and at least half the year yeah. you know and come back up here and, and have a home here and somewhere that um i can i don't think i'll ever retire mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, somewhere I, I can wind down a little bit sure. with my family for sure. Yeah, I don't, for some reason I just I don't know you well, but I don't I don't see you retire. I don't think so. <laughs> everything you have going on, um, I like to ask everyone um, if you could have a drink with anyone, who would it be? Oh my gosh, you're gonna think this is the worst answer no. of all time, but I have to be honest with you. That's all we want is honesty, and also I've I've done 500 interviews, okay. so I've this heard is, a lot. This is pretty bad, and it's also painful. But my hero is Matthew Stafford. <laughs> oh. oh. Oh, you're a huge I'm a huge Lions fan and now he's with the Rams and so I'm kind of rooting for the Rams but 
Uh, yeah, it would cool. be Stafford. I just yeah. think he's cool. I think yeah. he just seems like, like, and his wife seems really cool, too, so I think it would be just awesome to sit down and have a drink with him. I think that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, and kind of a final note to conclude, uh, why is Northern Michigan so special to you? I mean, it's special to me because it's, there's just nowhere in the world that's like it, you know? There's really not. Um, it, it just has its own identity, it has its own vibe, and it's, it's just one of those places that you can't, like, you have to be here to get it, you know, you really do. And then it's also one of those things where it's kind of a secret. It's right. still kind of a secret. So when I'm on the road or when I meet somebody and I talk to them and it's like, oh, Traverse City, and they go, oh, I've been to Traverse City, you instantly have this like, oh, you know the secret. Yes. You know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's so fun. Well, yeah. cheers again to all your success. Cheers. And thank you for taking the time out when you're on tour. Thank you. To have Appreciate a drink it. with us. Thank you. <laughs>